five. Five down low. Five, five times. One, two, three, four, five. High five. Don't leave me hanging. You are watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University. With more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, a land grant, space grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today. I'm Dave Mistich. It's not unusual to see tempers flare and a tug of war in the final days of the legislative session, and the 2021 session is no different. Tonight, we'll discuss the battling priorities of Republicans and Democrats as work continues on a reconciliation of a 2022 state budget. And we'll examine the back and forth between members of the House and Senate supermajorities as they try to agree on a personal income tax repeal plan. But first, House Judiciary Chair Moore Capito and House Judiciary Minority Chair Chad Lovejoy joined Emily Allen yesterday to review pandemic-related policy changes, criminal justice reform, and more. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. It means a lot. Uh, to start, obviously, uh, we've, we're coming out of a pandemic. A lot of the legislation that has been through your committee deals with several uh, different situations and things that we saw during that period. Uh, we've been over workplace liability, unemployment benefits, uh, the governor's emergency powers. Um, starting with you, Chairman Capito, can you talk a little bit about the legislation that has made it through, um, that has been informed or influenced by the pandemic? I think probably, uh, and thank you, Emily, for having us on. It's uh, It's been an interesting session, but I think a productive one. And I would say that really everything that we did this session was probably driven in some form by the pandemic, whether it was focusing early on on critical pieces of legislation that, that typically are taken up later or the protocols that we had in place with uh, access to the Capitol. Uh, what it impacted how we conducted virtual hearings, which I was very proud of this year in, in our committee. So really everything that we did was driven uh, by the pandemic. And, and quite frankly, as a result, I think we had some positive momentum uh, early on, which we've, which we've been able to, I believe, keep throughout uh, the session. Uh, Delegate Lovejoy, turning to you and giving you an opportunity to, to speak to this question, what um, kind of pandemic-influenced legislation or work do you think has been most crucial or significant out of the committee? Well, thanks again for having us. Uh, uh, Chairman's right. You know, we came in in the very beginning. There were We didn't know if we were going to be here for you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks. We didn't know what was going to happen. So there was a real concerted effort in the beginning to, to tackle some pretty big things that you've mentioned. And, um, and so from the emergency powers, which I think may have been one of the first bills that we took on, and of course that's still, um, still in the news here towards the end, um, and getting into the COVID liability, unemployment, it, it really, um, we worked really, we worked really hard the whole session, but those first couple of weeks, you know, a lot of times there's a, there's a slower entry and then the, the, the frantic pace at the end and here we had a very frantic pace worked the first Saturday uh, on some legislation to get that through and uh, and now it feels like it kind of feels like it's been a whole session of of the end of the session uh, which is an interesting pace something else that is also significant about the both of you and your committee is that you are both first-time chairs to my understanding uh, you come from uh, predecessors who had been overseeing the committee or with the house for a long time and I, I remember specifically the last chairman made sort of a priority out of focusing on overcrowding and regional jails and criminal justice reform you know more reentry and rehabilitation efforts 
Um, I, I guess this time we'll, we can start with Delegate Lovejoy. Can you talk a little bit about um, things that we might have seen out of the House Judiciary Committee that are most significant dealing with reentry, uh, criminal justice reform, overcrowding, and the, the likes? Sure. Uh, you're exactly right. Both the chairman and I came in in uh, 2016 and served for the last four years under Chairman John Schott, and it was it was particularly a passion for him. And I'm, I'm really glad to see, you know, Chairman Capito has, has picked that ball right up and ran with it because I think it's something very important to, to the legislature and certainly to West Virginia. So um, I know, you know, he's originated um, uh, a bill on uh, the Department of Corrections doing reentry and transitional housing, kind of modeled after the, the what the federal uh, system does. Um, I think that bill may be on second or third reading today or tomorrow, but uh, that's moving forward. Also, uh, juvenile restorative justice, I think, was a big one. And so so uh, he's done a great job of continuing uh, what I think is a very important fight for West Virginians. Chairman Capito, would you want to kind of elaborate on that more and speak a little bit to some of the, that legislation, especially the reentry uh, piece? Yeah, Delegate Lovejoy's right. You know, one of the things that I think we've prided ourselves on in our committee, uh, to some degree, we don't always agree, but uh, but we've really done a good job working in a bipartisan manner on, on uh, criminal justice reform. I don't think that can be denied. It's something that I'm particularly passionate about. Uh, he spoke about John Schott. We all miss John, and we can't quite fit into his shoes, but we can carry on his legacy in that regard uh, and try to live up to that. We've We've taken two uh, figuring out solutions to how to get uh, West Virginians back on their feet when they come back into our communities. And quite frankly, I think, you know, the most honorable and courageous thing that we can do as legislature, legislators is turn toward difficult situations. And we've certainly tried to do that this year, uh, whether it be... Um, you know, showing compassion in pieces of our legislation, uh, listening to individuals that are struggling to get back on their feet, that are coming out of the correction system, uh, whether it's doing reentry housing, whether it's providing classes in community corrections instead of in the in the facilities, transitioning um, individuals that want to transition back into society, helping them to get on their feet bringing them and immersing them back into the communities in a stable and easy way uh, to make sure that everybody in West Virginia has a good outcome. I think one of the, the longest debates I've seen in your committee on a piece of criminal justice reform legislation was most recently uh, House Bill 2017 rewriting the criminal code. Um, the Senate most recently, their Judiciary Committee, uh, amended it to forward some of those provisions in that bill as recommendations to a sentencing commission. What do you hope to see out of that effort and what might people be able to expect from the committee with that topic going forward? Well, I, I can tackle that one first. Let me just say that the, that the interim committee that worked on this criminal code rewrite worked extremely hard put in hours and hours of work i mean this is a lot a lot of work and in, in yeoman's work at that it was more uh, than 400 pages i don't think i, I it, mentioned that yeah I mean, it, it was yeah. it was 400 plus pages and hours and hours of a collaboration and i'm really happy that we took consideration of the bill because i think all of that work merited a discussion and i think we had a robust and good discussion the Senate, uh, you know, obviously took an action to study it further. We have a sentencing co a commission that will look into it, but I think it provides. I think that work now provides the sentencing commission with a, a good bit of homework that's been done for them uh, that they can look into, make adjustments, and hopefully we can go from there as we approach next year and into the summer. Delegate Lovejoy, anything to add on that effort or topic? Well, it, 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 he's exactly right. It was it was a lot of work, and it's necessary work. I mean, you have a criminal code that over 160 years has developed, so you have antiquated, you know, uh, code provisions that just aren't things anymore. But you, then you have this issue of kind of uh, uh, parity and justice. So sometimes we would pass laws over the last, you know, 100 plus years that were particularly mad at a crime or a group. And so we put in a, a new crime for that. But when you do that over time, you you may have a higher penalty for, for one thing than like like third degree shoplifting than, than some of the crimes where life is taken. And so you have to take a 30,000 foot view. And that's what this bill uh, uh, does. And that's what we're going to continue to do until we until we get it right. Moving on, uh, another bill that kind of came into your committee towards the last week's of the session was Senate Bill uh, 565, uh, dealing with various voting provisions. And obviously, we're coming out of a somewhat historic 2020 election for absentee and early voting. There was a public hearing on this bill Monday, very lengthy. I know there are a lot of people that signed in. Um, but this will not be a bill that is leaving your committee. You guys are no longer meeting. Um, can you uh, either of you speak to uh, what you still have to consider and what people might expect with that topic going forward? Sure. You know, 
elections are really one of the most important things that we do in a civil society, and it's one of the bedrock principles of a of the democracy that we have. I think uh, our Secretary of State uh, did a tremendous job in this last election in the midst of a pandemic. I think uh, we have topics that uh, need to be looked into regarding our elections, always making sure that they're uh, carried out in a transparent uh, manner, that we keep them uh, in a contemporary state uh, moving forward uh, with the way that we are as a society, whether it relates to technology or how people get from one place to, to another or how they're voting, frankly. So, uh, and again, I think the secretary has done a good job with that. Uh, the particular piece of legislation that you referred to, again, we don't have time to look at every bill every year. Uh, this is something that we'll continue to look at, uh, again, because I, I believe strongly uh, in the uh, in the elections process, and I think always keeping our eye on it's a good thing and not a bad one. Delegate Lovejoy, anything to add quickly on that? A hundred percent. I do commend the chairman on, on convening the public hearing. I'd say the Judiciary Committee had more public hearings than probably all the other committees combined, and so he's committed to having public uh, participation, and I think it was important on this bill. I think the last thought I want to leave people with is just sort of a, a broad accomplishment, starting with you, Chairman Capito, you know, in your first year, very busy year. Uh, what do you wh what is one thing that you want to leave with people watching or, or listening to this w one large accomplishment from the committee? Well, as we stated at the top and thank you again, Emily, for having us, we came into this session in kind of a rush. Uh, and it was just it was brought on by the pandemic. We we had a lot of legislation early and a lot of hard work by individuals to put that legislation together. And I think that and I, and I think my friend would agree that we really rolled up our sleeves and we made legislation better. We did it in a bipartisan manner. Uh, we didn't always agree. We had structural changes. We have a new court in West Virginia. We did criminal justice reform. I'm proud of some of the uh, renewable energy pieces of legislation that we did in committee. I mean, we really dug in and worked really, really hard this year. And I'm proud of the work that we did. And I'm really proud that I think we made a lot of legislation even better. Delegate Lovejoy is a member of the minor minority and minority chair for this committee in a time of a super majority. Uh, what do you think uh, has been a, a great accomplishment for you or, or maybe even something that the committee has missed out on or something that you'd want to see going forward? I guess what I would want people to know is that in this committee, you know, ideas are debated. You're right. You know, there's six of us and there's 19 in the majority, but there hasn't been one committee or one bill that we didn't have a chance to, to make our, our statement, to ask questions, to make amendments. And so I feel in my my committee uh, members that you know we got a fair shake to to make sure all perspectives were heard and advocated and so I, I agree that uh, we've done good work and and we've we've done the hard work to try to make things better well thank you again so much for being here I appreciate it and I hope you guys have a great rest of the session thank you thanks, thanks Emily. after that conversation yesterday the sentence changes to House Bill 2017 rewriting the criminal code were referred to the House Judiciary Committee effectively killing the bill Delegates have instead introduced a concurrent resolution to have House and Senate leadership consider provisions in the bill along with an advisory state sentencing commission under the Department of Homeland Security. And now it comes down to the budget. Joining me to discuss where things are on day 59 are Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News and Stephen Allen Adams of Ogden Newspapers. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. I want to start off by saying that as we're meeting right now, it's about two o'clock. We're taping this a little bit early before the show airs. A lot of news going on, particularly with the uh, personal income tax reduction plan. We're awaiting something to happen in the House. Uh, we'll start with you, Brad. Tell us where we sit at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Well, the, the word we've been getting, all of us, I think, for the last day or so, is that the House was not going to take a lot of action on this income tax bill and sales tax bill that has been the talk of the legislative session. Uh, what I heard earlier today was that the, the House was going to uh, essentially park that in uh, the, their non-action agenda. They weren't going to really take it up. Well, the governor heard that too and made some pretty choice comments about it at midday during one of his briefings, uh, essentially said that uh, he is all in on this, that the Senate has voted it into, into being, and, and that they clearly, even though it was an 18 to 16 vote, he perceives the Senate as being in also and, and said he just can't imagine that the House would just sit on this. He believes in it so much. Uh, had a lot of choice words about it. Uh, seemed really um, oh, uh, emotional, I guess. You know, just, he, he really believes in this and it's been his top agenda item and just could not believe the House was sitting on it. Well, then delegates who were in their floor session at the time 
became aware of what he was saying and and the way he was saying it and we began to hear that they are going to take some action by the time you see or listen to our comments tonight that will have happened but the house is reacting to what the governor said and and i i don't think it's going to be as mild an action as just setting that bill aside right and we should point out that the senate of course on wednesday passed their version of house bill 3300 uh Stephen, do you want to break down what that bill, you know, has in it and, and what the differences are between the, the House and Senate positions? Sure. Uh, basically, this is a combination of the Justice for All plan that the governor presented at a summit Monday uh, with uh, legislative leadership and the majority and minority, and a combination of some changes that the uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Eric Tarr, Republican at uh, Putnam County, made. Uh, it would cut the uh, personal income tax for all rates by 50 percent in the first year, uh, creates a plan to phase that out. Uh, I didn't hear a timetable on that, but the goal was to phase it out over a series of years. Uh, it also includes the governor's tiered income tax plan, uh, a retooled version, because the governor retooled that uh, in his Justice for All plan. Also includes uh, the $35,000 uh, uh, tax rebate uh, for people that make less than uh, $35,000 per year. That wasn't in the original Senate version. Uh, all of this is vastly different than the House version, which, of course, didn't include any tax increases. The Senate plan, the new plan now includes a uh, consumer sales tax increase from 6% to 8%. But the House version uh, would have phased out the income tax by $150 million every year, really over a decade, if not longer, depending on some of the smoothing mechanisms. So there are vast, vast differences between the plans that the governor and the Senate now support and the House supports. And of course, all of this runs alongside, you know, the budget, um, you know, the personal income tax and the budget kind of go hand in hand, especially given the, the path that they've been on. Um, do, do the both of you want to discuss, you know, where we are with the budget? I know the, the Senate, of course, passed their version uh, Wednesday night, you know, just after the, uh, the PIT uh, plan came out. Uh, when do you guys want to pick that up and, and, and talk about where we are with that? Well, the key issue, I think, as things are fluid, is that the Senate's budget appeared to leave millions of dollars of room for this income tax cut uh, to, to make up for some of that money. And so if that bill is going to fail, then the House needs to do something to... to uh, if the House does nothing and leaves that gap, then it's going to be this silly situation where a lot of cuts are being made, 1.5% across state agencies, while the state is also running what we believe is a $200 million surplus. So even though the budget could pass without the tax bill, you would still think that you'd want to make some adjustments, and the House hasn't done that yet, hasn't even received it. Yeah, you know, back when the governor presented his... Uh uh, his version of the personal income tax. I talked with uh, Stephen Baldwin, the my Senate Minority Leader out of Greenbrier County, and he had a great observation compared this to what happened in 2017. Now, 2017, you had a $500 million budget hole, but other than that, a lot of similarities between what happened, which caused the budget to fail uh, at the end of session in 2017. They had to come back in a special session. There was a cow platter uh, with a uh, cow pie on it that the governor vetoed that particular budget on. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, and I'm, I have to wonder whether perhaps we'll see a situation this time where maybe the governor might not be so inclined to support the budget this time as well. We still have to have a special session. And, and jumping back to this personal income tax and, and the budget itself, um, I mean, is it possible that we wind up in a special session with this issue? I, I know we heard from the governor today talking about a, a quote-unquote roadshow that he would go on to continue to push uh, for this T PIT plan, I, I mean, would we expect that at all? Is that something that uh, that, that we see coming after Saturday at midnight? I, I would have my doubts on the budget. The, the governor did issue a proclamation that he is bound to do to say, well, you got one more day if you need it. Uh, it time is running short on it, but, you know, I, I think that's within the realm of possibility to achieve in the next day or so. But on the income tax Frankly, that is equally unclear to me for different reasons. The governor did talk about going on a road show, uh, kind of like he did for the Roads to Prosperity, uh, educating people, he said. And then when, when communities around West Virginia are seeing it the way the governor does, uh, 
then I think the hope is that their delegates will too. And only then I think he's seeing the possibility of a special session. And I know the governor had uh, talked about on the briefing today, talked about uh, people just aren't getting it. And he wants to be able to explain to the people his uh, tax plan, this tax plan that was developed between him and the state Senate. I bumped into House Finance Chairman Eric Householder yesterday afternoon, and he basically said the opposite. He said everyone he's hearing from uh, obviously do not support the plan as it has currently come over from the Senate and negotiated with the governor's office. So uh, there's going to be a lot of education that the governor is going to have to try to do on this to try to get the message out there. Just going back home to my home county if, uh, a couple weeks ago, asking people randomly about this, people were more like, eh. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of reaction to it one way or the other. So the governor's got a lot of education to do on it. Right. And moving on, uh, it's the session certainly does not revolve around just the, the personal income tax reduction or the budget. Um, you know, there, right now there's some you know, proposed constitutional amendments that have been considered and are teed up to potentially wind up on the ballot in a special session in July where, here, where it's looking like. Uh, Brad, do you want to give a quick rundown of what, what you're seeing with those? Well, overall, one thing that is afoot is a possible midsummer election on a variety of constitutional matters. Uh, you know, throughout the session, people talked, when, when they would, would describe each individual bill, it was described as a vote of the people because it's a constitutional amendment on the the upcoming general election will be 2000 which will be 2022 all of a sudden the last few days there's talk of a saturday july 24th election in west virginia with four or five you know a handful of uh constitutional amendments for the citizens to decide well the question about that is if you're having a special election for it and it is pretty soon uh, and it is the only stuff on the ballot. W what is the cost, and can county clerks get elect get get ready for it? Uh, so that's that's one issue. As a subplot to that, th there was one potential amendment today that would establish term limits for the constitutional officers, aside from the governor, the attorney general, secretary of state, those offices, and that was put uh, kind of on the back burner today. It, of course, we've still got one more day, but but don't quite know where that bill st that resolution stands. Yeah, and keep in mind, of course, you know these are uh, joint resolutions. They require a supermajority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, there are several. Uh, of these resolutions on the Senate side that's on their agenda today. Uh, you're looking at a property tax. Give uh, lawmakers the opportunity to phase that out. Uh, you've got uh, trying to deal with uh, you no know, the impeachment ones like uh, that's on the other side. Well, point being, you still got to have 23 senators uh, in order to get it through. Uh, it's easier for the House because they have a big supermajority. Question is, does the Senate have the votes within the Republican uh, supermajority to move these? Right, right. And, and looking back uh, across this session, you know, you, you talk about these supermajorities. What, what in, in, in your guys' minds is has been big wins for these, you know, for the Republicans, uh, given the numbers that they've got? Um, we saw some major piece of legislation fail. One, uh, a House priority that that looked to reel in some of the governor's priorities, uh, governor's powers during a state of emergency. Um, talk a little bit about priorities and and how it all fell down over the course of session. Well, I'll start real quick first. Education was a big part of this, and they got some of those bills moving first. They were able to expand charter schools, uh, to move those up to ten every three years. They were able to get. Uh, really the most expansive education savings uh, account program in the country uh, passed through. So they have a few of their education priorities that they were able to get success for. Intermediate Appellate Court, which was signed technically yesterday, but there was a ceremonial signing for that bill today, Senate Bill 275. Uh, Republicans have been working on that issue for a long time. They were finally able to get it over the finish line this time. So those are def definite victories for the Republican supermajority this year. Brad, any thoughts on that? Today, the broadband bill passed. That's one that West Virginia communities have been talking about, uh, trying to improve broadband. And, and the pandemic made that clear as people tried to connect with their loved ones for their education, for their jobs. Uh, so passed today in the Senate with some changes. Got to go back to the House, but that's going to pass. Uh, and then 
the, the super majorities that we spoke of have made it possible for a resolution that would allow the legislature to make changes to property taxes, personal property taxes. That's another one that would be on the ballot for voters, but you, you've got to have two thirds to be able to do that kind of thing to even get it to that point. And so those super majorities have made that possible. Look for that uh, possible amendment on property taxes to be on a ballot near you, possibly at midsummer. We've got just about a minute left, so I'm going to give you guys each about 30 seconds on this final question. Um, you know, we are on day 59 right now, headed into day 60. Um, a lot happening on this day 59. So I, I guess my question is, is what can we expect in the final hours Saturday as we head towards midnight? Brad, we'll start with you. Well, I, I think fireworks today as the House responds to the governor's own reaction on the income tax bill, and, and that issue has been building to a boil, may boil over today, but after that, I would expect calm and, and routine legislating. Stephen? Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think also all eyes are going to be on the budget. I, I think Brad's ultimately right that I think at the end of the day, a budget will come out of this. Uh, but that's going to be the thing to watch, to see what type of changes happen between uh, the Senate version in the past and the House version. And as Brad said, it leaves a lot of money on the table, the Senate version. So uh, I suspect there'll be some changes to try to reconcile a lot of those differences. But I think at the end of the day, it'll come out tomorrow. Well, that's uh, Stephen Allen Adams of Ogden Newspapers and Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, we'll see how the next uh, few hours play out today and as we head into tomorrow. Thank you both. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. A reminder, that conversation was taped earlier today. Moments after, the House unanimously voted to reject House Bill 3300, effectively killing the personal income tax reduction. For more on that story, visit us online at wvpublic.org. As we close the program, a reminder that West Virginia Public Broadcasting continues a decades-long tradition by covering the final hours of the 2021 legislative session. Tomorrow evening, beginning at 8 p.m., we'll be reporting live from the Capitol building, following the action in both the Senate and House of Delegates up to the session's midnight deadline. That's the final hours broadcast of the 2021 legislative session, beginning at 8. I'm Dave Mistich. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a good evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, a land-grant, space-grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Fasten your seatbelt. Go on a wild journey. I'm scared. This is the point where you reveal I'm not even